appreciating uh, the reality of death helps you to appreciate the reality of life instead of take it for granted. How I think about death is how I think about life. You need to be able to inhabit whatever situation you're in, fully inhabit it. Doesn't mean you have to like it, but you have to be able to appreciate what it offers. And there's a big difference. I'm Deborah Jarvis, and you're listening to The Final Say. This is the podcast where you can get comfortable talking about death and learn some things about life from people who are dying. In this episode, we'll hear about the Buddhist perspective on dying and death. We'll hear the story of a doctor who refused to acknowledge the death of his patient. And the answer to the question, what is the most important thing we can offer someone who is approaching death? Bonus questions, what do you want on your tombstone, and what would you like for your last meal? Today I'm talking with Genko Blackman, who is a Zen Buddhist priest and has stage 3 ovarian cancer. I was raised in a Quaker family, so I had a kind of standard Judeo-Christian understanding overlaid with my dad's Quaker kind of way of looking at it, which was what happens after death, who knows. Tell me, what was it that first piqued your interest in Buddhism? Oh, well, there was a couple things. One was that my father was very much a serious meditator, and he actually was my first meditation teacher. He would tell me things like, you will see people in meeting moving around. Don't move. They can do whatever they're going to do, but sit as still as you can because every time you move, it distracts you from the silence. I must have been like four or five when he told me this. And the other thing he said when I was very little was, don't think about stuff. He said, don't worry it in your head. That's not what meeting is for. If you're going to worry something in your head, do what I do. He says, there's a deep well inside of you. Take that worry. Drop it deep inside the well and forget about it. And he said, it might not be during meeting, but sometimes something will bubble up and you will have an answer to your worry. That was fabulous advice, yeah. So those were the two things he taught me. I felt like that was really wonderful that I had that instruction, but I also felt I wanted to go deeper and deeper in my meditation, in reading about it, it seemed like Zen meditation might be something that would deepen it. So that was kind of the initial way I was raised. And at this point, I'm an ordained Zen Buddhist priest, and there's a very specific way that Buddhism looks at death as well, which is that it's part of a cycle of life and death. It's not the end of something. It's just a transition into a new form of something. But it also, within the Zen context, we have an I don't know quality to it. So that made it a very smooth transition in a way to see it that way. So tell me what, if you're like envisioning like your own death, what would be the best case scenario for you? What would that look like? Boy, that it's not too upsetting for people to observe. So, for example, if I'm in a lot of pain, that that pain is under control. The last thing I want is for people to have to have that as their last memory. So that that would be pretty important to me. I also don't really want there to be a sense of desperation about it. And I don't want to spend any more money or time or energy on trying to fix something that's not broken. It's just this is the way it's unfolding. Right. I love that word unfolding. Mm -hmm. This is the way it's unfolding. That's very, very difficult for people to accept that. Yeah. Why do you think it's so hard for people in our culture to talk about death? I think that people see death as a failure in some ways. I know a lot of medical people do, particularly doctors, feel like if they aren't able to keep you going, that they've somehow failed. And I think people buy into that. 
that somehow death is an unnatural thing or that there's some age at which you need to die. It's been interesting to me talking with people who are in their 90s. It's so much, it's just so the reverse of of birth and growth, right? Mm -hmm. You get things taken away from you. That's what it feels like if you think that your life is a particular package of things. So I've got this, I've got that. And then you're constantly really fighting to keep everything in place because in fact, nothing stays in place. That's a very important Buddhist teaching is, oh, you think you've got it? (laughs) Yeah, just wait till the next minute unfolds. This is actually a Christian teaching, too, which I learned in the form of a joke. So a young seminarian goes into their mentor and says, this is all too hard, the studying, the scripture, the counseling, the prayer, the good behavior. I don't think I'm cut out to be in the ministry. And the mentor nods and nods and then says, yes, my child, this shall pass. A few weeks later, the seminarian comes in once again to meet with their mentor and says, oh, my gosh. Everything is absolutely wonderful. I'm passing all my courses. The people I'm counseling are seeing a new way. And prayer comes easily to me now. I can see that I am truly called to the ministry. And the mentor nods and nods and then says, Yes, my child, this too shall pass. The point being that nothing stays the same. And that's the curse. And that's also the blessing of it all. And what we believe about death really does affect how we experience our lives. So I asked Genko this question. So how do you think your beliefs about death has affected how you're dealing with this cancer diagnosis and your treatment? Okay, what about my life needs to change or doesn't need to change? What do I value? What's not so important? So it was really more in that context that I thought about it instead of a sense of, oh, this is scary. I'm going to die. What does that mean? Yeah. It's, I already know what it means. Nobody knows. Right, right, right. You know, oh, my teacher would say, when I'd say, what, what is the Buddhist view of death? He said, oh, well, I don't know. I, maybe I come back and teach you. (laughs) (laughs) So his point was, I don't have any recollection of dying. Right. Can't really give you good information about it. It's easy to say we don't know and just kind of shrug our shoulders, but do we do that because we're truly okay not knowing? Or is it just because it kind of blows our minds? Because I'm not really sure that my mind can conceive of not me being here. I don't know, when I start to really think about it, it's as if I get that computer spinning pinwheel You know, I feel like I need to do a force quit or a hard shutdown. But, wow, there is one thing for sure that contemplating death forces you to do, and that is appreciate life. And it's no surprise that Genko feels the same way. I think appreciating uh, the reality of death helps you to appreciate the reality of life instead of take it for granted. How I think about death is how I think about life. You need to be able to inhabit whatever situation you're in, fully inhabit it. Doesn't mean you have to like it, but you have to be able to appreciate what it offers. And there's a big difference. Well, here's a question that I ran across recently and I thought, and I've thought about it a long time and I haven't answered it for myself. And the question is, if you could be given an envelope that has your exact time and date of death, Mm-hmm. Would you open it? Oh, no. I, I just don't think that would be useful information for me. For one thing, if it's more than a day out, I'm going to say, oh, I've got plenty of time. <laughs> you know, I'll get to that. Right. Yeah. The, a conversation I had with my mother in the uh, last couple of years before she died, she said, don't you girls worry. I will have all my paperwork sorted out so that you don't have to work with it. Well, she lied. Of course, she didn't do anything with her paperwork. And we had to go through boxes of things, which was, you know, she had legal documents mixed in with expired grocery coupons. It was just ghastly. (laughs) More than once, I found myself yelling at her going, get back down here. You said you were going to do this. Sort this out. You help me with this. Yeah. Otherwise, it's all going to the shredder. 
You know, my dad died a year ago and I just <laughs> finished doing all that. And I just found myself saying over and over again, what were you thinking? Yeah, why? What is it? Why did you save this box of obviously burned out light bulbs? Yeah. Do you think you're going to fix them? Yes. I mean, yeah. So we can't know. <laughs> no, no. My mother had, she had other things very carefully sorted out. She had two old cigarette boxes from the 40s. One was very carefully labeled good sewing needles, and the other was labeled bad sewing needles. What is that? Why would you save a box of sewing needles that don't work? Did your mom know my dad? (laughs) (laughs) Were you with your mom when she died? Yes. It was actually kind of funny. She died, and I'll never forget this, the night of George Bush's 2004 State of the Union address. My sister lived with her the last few years of her life, and she kept the TV on constantly. But the one thing was she couldn't stand to see George W. Bush or hear him speak. So whenever he would come on, my sister had to leap out of the chair and go turn the TV off till he stopped talking. So I My mother, she wanted morphine. She was having difficulty breathing, and it was hard to get a doctor who was willing to prescribe it for her. And that was because the doctor who was her doctor of record at the hospital said, you know, the morphine is going to suppress her breathing and shorten her life. I I said, do you have any idea how absurd that is, what you just said? She would kind of like to go before the State of the Union address comes on the TV. (laughs) To be perfectly honest, but this doctor could not connect with that. I mean, his job was to keep her alive, even if that just meant 20 minutes more. That was success to him, and he refused to give her morphine. And I talked to the nurse about it, and I said, is there anybody else? Can we? Is there any way we can do an end run around this guy? She said, there is, but we have to wait for him to go home. And she found a doctor who had never seen my mother before, but was willing to give her morphine. He understood what the point was at that point. She wasn't on hospice. We hadn't had time for any of that. Gave her the morphine. So she had literally not moved or spoken for hours, but she had the TV on because she always wanted it kind of as a comfort level. She'd been lying in my lap and they said, ladies and gentlemen, the president of the United States She sat bolt upright and just glared at the TV set. And I had to kind of move her over and turn the set off. I said, you're you're right. You don't need to have his voice in your ears while you're dying. I get that. That was our last conversation. Wow. And then did she just kind of slip away? She did. She lay back down. My sister had gone to do something. She, I, I could hear that she was skipping breaths. I said, Mom, hang on a little bit because Sally isn't back yet. Could you just hang on till she gets back? She nodded, and she did. Then my sister got back, and about 20 minutes later, she was gone. She just stopped. That You know, that gap between breaths, just that was it. There was no other breath. So it was that peaceful. And then when she died, he was the only doctor that came back to see how we were doing. It was very interesting. I never heard from the yeah, uh, the other doctor again. Yeah, no. In fact, the funeral director had to go to his office and and stand in front of the reception desk and say, "You need to sign the death certificate. She's been down in the hospital for a week, and we need the body so that we can cremate it." He finally got the doctor to come out and sign it because he was announcing it in front of all the patients in the waiting room. It's bad enough that it. As a culture, we're afraid of death, but when your medical providers are afraid of death. Refusing to even acknowledge that it had happened. I'm sure he felt it was a personal failure on his part that this patient died. I mean, she was 86 years old. She had emphysema. Yeah. She was ready, man. She was done. I I mean, it was just misfortune that they ended up with that particular specialist from that particular office who was just a dinosaur about it. Okay, so hopefully 
it's 2020 now, and our medical providers are now more educated and accepting about death. Fingers crossed. So I asked Ginkgo to talk about the moments just before death and what that is like. There's a point at which the breath doesn't happen again, but also you're really aware of the active dying stage. They are more aware of beings that might be in other realms. And saying that sounds fantastical, but it's like because their energy is more crossed over, as my mother would say, they have contact with different forms of energy than we do when yes. we're grounded in this body. And after seeing that, after experiencing that a number of times, I really take that seriously. And what happens right after you die? Well, in Protestant Christianity, the belief is that you die and immediately wake up in heaven or hell. It's a little different for Catholics. Catholic doctrine says that if you've racked up a boatload of sins, you have to pay for them before you can enter heaven. So you do that in purgatory, which I imagine this is kind of like standing in the checkout line. The more you have, the longer it takes. Or maybe, you know, there's an express line for 10 sins or less. But anyway, the entrance is not immediate. And in Buddhism, there also seems to be a slight delay before arriving at your final destination. They've checked out of interactions in this realm to uh, the moment of death from a medical standpoint to the fact that there's a, a fair period after that where things are occurring. And Buddhism actually addresses that period right after they say, think about it, you know, you're changing realms, so you're no longer constrained by that physical form. It's kind of confusing, though. You imagine like when a baby is born, dying is very similar to being born into a different realm. So there's a period of time, 49 days, where you need to provide some assistance and encouragement to this individual so that they don't try to stay too close to this transition point, but that any residual kind of anxiety around being in that life form can uh, resolve itself. So there's a period of 49 days of chanting and incense and water. Tell me about the water. It's associated with purity. So water is an extremely important thing. And the incense is offered because in that period of time, you need sustenance. You still kind of physically somehow connected, uh, but of course you can't eat because you don't have a body. So the understanding is that you receive nourishment from incense. So you're always going to save your best, most expensive incense for funeral offerings. So offering that incense with the intention of nourishing them and helping them and kind of saying, uh, you're okay, it's confusing, it's difficult, but keep going, we're cheering you on. So then I asked Genko, what is the best way to be with someone who's facing death? What, what can we offer them? Instead of coming in and offering all sorts of, of advice and assistance to say, talk to me about how you're doing right now and let that person unfold however they're going to do that. And then you can respond to what they're saying. For sure, tell the person how much you care for them. That's really important. You know, it's not about, oh, I'm going to make you a project of mine. If you really consider yourself a friend, you will go see them and just say what's going on. This is really hard for me, but I care so much for you. I want to come be with you and talk to me about how you're doing. You don't have to say anything or do anything or offer some help. That's not what the person needs. I think the most important thing that we can offer is just a calm, fully present being there. And it's not about me observing somebody dying. It's about this person going through this and me witnessing their transition with them. I think it's just difficult for people to be comfortable with their own discomfort. Yes. 
I think that's yeah. really a lot of it. Yeah. Yeah. Their own pain around their fear of their own death, their right. fear of your death, mm -hmm. you know, their fear of the grief around your death. Right. I think that's a big one. What's your opinion about sudden death versus a longer death? It's hard because people haven't had a chance to prepare and also they haven't necessarily tied themselves in knots about it either. But to me, having a little sense of warning is good. There's a prayer we chant in Zen Buddhism say, may I know about my approaching death a minimum of seven days before. So like at least a week. I'd like a week to prepare to know that this is happening. Yeah, I mean, that's very explicitly stated in it. Although Ginkgo knew she was going to die sooner than she'd like, she kept living her life. And one of the things she continued to do was visit her old friends. I went to visit my college roommate, which I do every year. And it seemed this year was a really important one to make that happen. It was fabulous. Mostly you're sitting around in your pajamas talking about stuff, but... We'd go down to the river every day, kind of walk around as well as we could, and then come back and rest. It sounds like it's kind of that both and thing <clears throat> where this is what we do every year. This is like a regular normal thing. And we're both very aware that we may not be able to do this many more years. Right. There's a special quality to it and an ordinary quality at the same time. That's right. I have to stop here and say that if we are really aware of how precarious life is, we would realize that every experience we have is both ordinary and special, because how do we know it's not our last? Is there anything that you would like an answer to before you die? More and more, I understand that most questions don't have answers. And so I don't feel that urgency about, I got to figure this out. I got to find this. It's more like, how do I want to spend this moment, this day, in the most full and appreciative way I can? So do Buddhists have tombstones? Usually in Japan, the custom is that it's just similar to the Jewish custom of uh, you have a temporary marker, and that gives you a year to come up with a permanent mm -hmm. marker. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's very common. There'd be a wooden uh, kind of a board there with the person's uh, posthumous name. They give new names in death so that when you call out that name, you, you if you call out their name on on in the life plane, uh, it can be very confusing, especially for newly dead people. It's like, what do they want me to come back? You don't want to upset them. So you give them a new name for this new uh, world that they're in. If you had something on your tombstone, which sounds like they don't do that, but what would you want said about you? She was there. <laughs> no, I mean, seriously, I showed up for my life. I would like people to say, you yeah, know, she was always right there. Well, that's pretty huge. Yeah, it is, because most of the time we're off in a dream world. At my dad's memorial service, his and my mother's best friend stood up, and she said the most wonderful thing about him. She said, it's hard for me not to have him around, kind of calming things down. She said, I could see him sitting in his chair, smoking his pipe, and it's the end of the world, and people are running around uh, just screaming and yelling and upset about it. And he would just say very calmly, it's all right, relax. It's not a big deal. It's just the end of the world. <laughs> and I thought, yeah, that's really him. That should be on his tombstone. How did he die? Well, he wasn't sick until a couple of years before he died. It was congestive heart failure. The doctor said, there's a couple things we can do to kind of extend your life a bit. But I have to tell you, your heart's not in great shape anyway. We can do this surgery. It'll give you a little more time, but it's not going to be a miracle. And he wanted not to do it. He felt like 
surgery was an extreme measure. But he also respected my mother saying, I, mm. I can't do this. I'm not ready. And it was only a year later when I said, you know, he's really suffering. Mom. She finally, she said, yeah, you're right. I need to tell him that it's okay. And my mother was at the hospital with him. And she said, I'm going to go home now. And she said, you know, if you're, if you're done struggling, I'm okay with it. It's okay. He was fine. And he died the next day, sitting up in bed, mid-sentence. He was waiting for permission, yeah. Nurse came in. He loved chatting with the nurses. And because he was a pipe smoker, he would puff on the pipe. And so oftentimes he would pause mid-sentence, even though he was no longer smoking, pause like he was puffing on his pipe. He was sitting up in bed talking about when he was a soccer coach, stopped mid-sentence. She said something to him, and he didn't respond. And she looked around, and he was sitting there, and his heart had stopped. It was such a peaceful, smooth pass. She called my mother, and she said, what should I do? His heart just stopped. And she said, leave it. Leave it. I'll be there in a few minutes. Wow. That sounds like a great way to die to me. In mid-sentence. The only thing that could be better is if you were laughing. The last thing we discussed, what kind of foods would you like for your last meal. We we talked about this as, in a, as a family once. I said, okay, you have one food you could take with you when you die. It's like they could put it in your coffin. <laughs> and um, my husband said pasta. And I said butter, anything with butter. I don't remember what our donor said. She probably was indecisive. And then... Uh, our son said, shrimp and chocolate. And I said, that's two things. He said, I know. <laughs> it's like, so? So I want to take shrimp and chocolate. So here's my final say for today. I think the most important thing we can offer someone dying is the most important thing we can offer to someone living. Being fully present and letting them unfold, witnessing whatever's happening with them, whether it's sorrow or joy. And sometimes it's harder to be present to someone is, who's joyful. I mean, have you ever had that experience? Maybe you've got a little envy or jealousy going on, or maybe you're just, you know, we're too wrapped up in our own stuff. But to be really present and celebrate or grieve with someone is such a gift. And what do you want on your tombstone? I don't know. I always thought that I would have on my tombstone the same thing I had on a gold charm that my dad gave me for my 16th birthday. And it read, live, love, laugh. And I'd like to think I've been doing that. So maybe that, I don't know. I have to think some more about that. Maybe that's just another way of saying she showed up for her life. And my deathbed meal? First, a really good champagne served in a champagne flute with a tin of smoked oysters, followed by a bunch of really nicely cooked green vegetables. I know, vegetables, but I love vegetables. So asparagus, broccoli, spinach. I was going to say sautéed in butter, but no, steamed. Why? Because along with that, I would like a lobster tail. Not a big one but a fresh one with a cup of clarified butter. And to finish, a cup of rose petal geranium flower tea and a whole case of Reese's peanut butter cups. Reese's, not any fancy designer peanut butter cups, Reese's. And they are not a sponsor of this podcast, but they could be if they wanted to. I'm Deborah Jarvis, and now I'm hungry. And thanks for listening to The Final Say. Thanks, as always, to Blue Dot Sessions for your awesome music. You guys rock. Mm -hmm.